hello everyone, wherever you are, it's a great pleasure uh, to be with you. And uh, above all, uh, hello Mark. Uh, as, <clears throat> as life would have it, and not least in the time of the pandemic, it's a long time since we actually met, but um, we've certainly met on, uh, on paper um, quite frequently during the last years, and it's great that we're now at opposite ends, at least, of the, uh, of the screen. Our, um, our topic this evening, as John said, is uh, <clears throat> this book, the surely the definitive history in English, at least, and poss quite possibly in any language, of the events that began in 1821, the epoch-making year whose 200th anniversary uh, has been celebrated by uh, Greeks and Greek speakers all over the world during the last uh, 12 months. And if the reality of the 200th anniversary and the possibilities for celebration, commemoration, re-evaluation of the past, if all of that has necessarily been somewhat knocked sideways by the COVID pandemic, one thing at least that has continued unabated is the spate of webinars, conversations, documentaries, uh, <clears throat> multi-authored volumes and books. Um, it's far too early to begin to reckon up the harvest of this astonishing, uh, the, the yield of this astonishing year, but I'm quite certain that uh, Mark's book, The Greek Revolution, 1821 and the Making of Europe, is a real landmark within it. So it's a great pleasure, Mark, to have you, uh, have you with us. And um, I look forward to batting about some ideas that arise out of uh, my uh, my reading of this uh, uh, of this book. So I suggest to kick things off. Perhaps you'd like just to set the tone by <clears throat> talking to us a little bit about the the origin of the book, how you came to write it, the challenges you faced in doing that, um, and. Um, I mean, it's usual to ask on an occasion like this, you know, why this topic? But in a way that's obvious. <laughs> but perhaps you'd like to say something about how the book connects in your mind with this year's anniversary. Yes, uh, thank you, Roddy. Thank you. Uh, it's a great privilege and pleasure to be in conversation with, with you uh, about this. And thanks to John and the British School for the invitation. Um, the short answer as to why I wrote the book is probably that I wanted to figure out what actually happened in 1821. Um, and that sounds rather odd because one's supposed to know since I, I, I teach uh, <laughs> modern Greek history. But in fact, I didn't feel that I really did know. And I, I didn't feel that this vast, you know, sprawling literature dozens, hundreds of works, dozens of histories of a thing had brought me to an understanding for reasons that we can talk about. So the primary task was as usual to try and figure something out. And although it might uh, uh, appear that I'd written it for uh, the bicentennial, that wouldn't really be true. It was more that the bicentennial uh, ended up forcing me to publish it. Um, I, I really started thinking about this about a decade ago when Greece was hit by austerity in the financial and banking crisis. And the question of sovereignty and independence and what, what was Greece any longer really independent was on everybody's minds. It was really rather questionable in those years whether Greece was any longer formally independent because the Troika exercised such power. And it got me thinking about uh, what independence, national independence, really meant for Greece, for Europe. And I started thinking about this whole 200 year span from the 1820s to the 2010s as a great arc. Um, and the, the beginning of this process, the beginning of Europe's embrace of the nation state, had really been at the time of the Greek struggle for independence. And so that seemed to me uh, the logical place to go to try to figure out what independence had meant, what sovereignty had meant to the people who were fighting for it. And so I started work back then, um, but I probably wouldn't have finished it had it not been 
firstly for COVID, which forced me to stay at home and work from the available sources. And then for the bicentennial, which meant that my publisher threatened to uh, kill me if I didn't get the book done in time to publish it this year. So it was a very effective way of bringing the thing to a conclusion. Thank you. Well, I, again, I mean, that is, um, it's, it's von Ranke, isn't it? What actually happened, that school of history as it really was. And uh, I'm interested that you, you place yourself quite explicitly in that, uh, in, in that tradition. Um, is that a fair, is that a fair sum, summing up? Uh, yes and no. Um, I am a believer in the view that history is about trying to figure out what really happened. Um, but that doesn't mean that I think it's about one damn thing after another. Um, I think every generation tries to figure out for itself what really happened in history, because every generation is posing a different set of questions to the past. And that probably wasn't Ranker's view, uh, I suspect, although I don't want to do Ranker an injustice. Um, but yes, trying to sift through the very often very polemical accounts, very deliberately partisan accounts of the fighting. One of the great things was that the fighting didn't stop when the war was over. It went on uh, in words and uh, the Colocotronis faction and the Mavrocordatos faction, everybody was piling in into print, laying into each other. So there was this explosion of historical writing, but it was very partisan. Um, and so the challenge is to sift through that and, and figure out for yourself what the larger, what the larger story is. Well, I think that, again, I mean, I think that's very timely because not least at the end, as we come to the end of this anniversary year, I mean, certainly anyone who's ever been to a Greek school or really has learned Greek as a foreigner either, has been through a certain set of lessons from which we think, you know, we might suppose we actually know you know, we know the story, the outlines are familiar, the characters are familiar. But I was very struck to hear you say that, you know, that that was your motivation, because it's often, <clears throat> there have been moments that have struck me during the anniversary year as well, when I sat down to think, actually, you know, I think I know, but what do I know? And your book really does, by asking the question in that way, it probably gets us as close as we're going to get to an answer. And again, I mean, I'm with you in what you say that, you know, every generation has its own need, you know, it, its own reconstruction. It, it creates the history it needs, the way it's, it sees its history from its own point of view. And I really do feel that, you know, this, this book lays the foundation. It presents um, an intelligible account of what happened that, uh, you know, I'm sure will, um, you know, will, will, will last for a long, for a long time. It's kind, of you, it's kind of you to say that, Roddy, and I hope you're right, but I'll give you an example of something that's changing very fast. Um, I was uncomfortably aware when I was writing it that there's almost nothing on the Ottoman um, strategy, on the Ottoman the fiscal resources of the Ottoman state, or on the Ottomans in general. Actually, there was more than one might think in Greek because the Greek memoirists often included mm. reference. It is. But there was almost nothing from the, and in 20 years time, I would wager any money that there will be a lot more. And then our whole understanding of this conflict will uh, uh, be one that incorporates the Ottoman dimension in a way that we just can't do now. Well, I'm sure you know the work of the, um, the splendid um, Ottomanist who is based in Athens, um, Shukru Ilijak. Mm -hmm. And I understand his new book on Ottoman sources on the revolution has just been published in 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 Greek. Um, mm -hmm. I haven't I haven't seen it. it. it well, it's it published by Brill, eleven hundred pages. Oh, it's it, in fact, you can access it online for free, and already that's transformative. So it's very exciting. Well, indeed. I mean, you're you're absolutely right. And um, but I think the fact that more things are being added doesn't detract from what you've brought into the story in the the story in this book. And actually, I'd like to take the discussion forward by asking you about the sources, because one of the, the, as I was reading it, one of the, almost the first thing that struck me was the, the richness and the variety 
of sources that you've trailed, you've trawled through an enormous amount of material, some of it inev inevi inevitably familiar, but an enormous amount of it not, and certainly unavailable in English before. And I suspect that some of the uh, some of the information and some of the backgrounds and some of the accounts you've uh, presented for us are not well or hardly at all known in Greek either. I think that you know that that's a a standout characteristic of the book for me that it is very much history from primary sources. The question I wanted to ask you is, if you like, it's the kind of opposite side of that question, um, because I was also quite struck that, <clears throat> um, I mean, unlike some people who've retold the story over the years, you don't say very much about your illustrious predecessors, uh, Thomas Gordon, uh, who went into was in print in 1832 before the ink had really settled on the uh, on the final treaties uh, in Greek, the four volumes of Spirinum Tricupis in the 1850s, and of course, from a BSA BSA British School at Athens perspective, our own George Finlay, um, who spent most of his life in Greece, beginning during the um, <clears throat> during the revolution, wrote what I still think of as the you know the classic. 19th century history of the revolution in English. Um, and uh, after his death, all his papers and his books found their way to the BSA. So within, as it were, those virtual walls, we feel him very much as, as one of our own. Um, I wondered, how, you know, how do you see your book in relation to those or perhaps others <clears throat> um, who've been there before you? And perhaps for this audience, um, you're, I'd be interested in your thoughts on uh, actually on Finley as a historian <clears throat> of the conflict. Yes, with pleasure. Well, Gordon, Gordon and Finley, I, I, I think are really remain classics, extraordinary, uh, very fresh, uh, full of extraordinary information. These were both guys who knew the terrain firsthand and it shows. They knew the people firsthand and it shows. Um, and so you could go back to them time and time again. And uh, in fact, uh, I started by reading Finley cover to cover, that he was going to be my roadmap. Um, Finley is a very uh, close to the ground roadmap. Uh, I really defy anybody to come to the end of the 700 pages on Finley's two volumes and summarize easily what happened. Uh, and, and, and I don't think he was trying to give that. He was trying to, he, he was a Victorian with a Victorian uh, polymath powers of concentration that I and I think we don't have today. And when you read Finlay and, or, or, or Gordon or Tricupis, it's very easy to, to lose sight of the wood for the trees. You just uh, you get lost in the detail because their coverage is above all comprehensive. And so that's one thing that I would say about Finley, and one of the reasons why I would say I didn't feel I knew what was going on. I felt that I was dodging around from the conflict in the Morea to the conflict in Rumili to the conflict in Crete. And one does have this feeling of multiple conflicts and that, that therefore I couldn't get an overarching sense of what stakes were. I think there were stakes for Finley and actually because I knew of your interest in Finley, I have Finley with me and I'll read out a little passage if you don't mind that I think gives you Finley's view. It's right at the beginning of the second volume when he's talking about the discussion that went on in Europe in 1823 between the enemies of Greece and the friends of Greece. And the enemies of Greece are saying, Greeks are hopeless lot, uh, the Sultan wasn't so bad, we shouldn't intervene and help revolution. And then he says, the friends of Greece, on the other hand, replied that if the Greek chiefs were worthless and the Greek government weak, the will of the people was strong and the nation would prove unconquerable. And I think that's Finlay. Finlay was, a romantic nationalist uh, steeped in that Byronic tradition and very smart about Byron. Well, you should be telling me about his view of Byron, I suppose, but I thought very smart about Byron. But um, uh, he has a mid 19th century understanding of na nations and nationalism. 
which is very different from an early 21st century of nations and nationalism. For me, the whole subject was how did the revolution produce not only the Greek state, but a sense of Greek nationalism. Finley, uh, it's the sense of Greek nationalism ultimately that explains the Greek victory. And so his philosophical starting point is very, very different from mine. I wanted to say something perhaps uh, about, about these Greek sources that you alluded to. Um, one of the benefits of being stuck at home for 18 months was I realized how much material had been digitized. And I went back to those mid 19th century sources. I'll give you, I'll give you, two, I'll give you three examples. Uh, Kolokotronis's son publishes an enormous compilation of documents about the war destined, of course, to show the heroism of his father. But it's huge. Nobody ever reads through the whole thing. I think it was sometime in the 1850s or the 1860s. About 20 years later, uh, somebody in Alexandria publishes an equally huge compilation that is a, a, an apologetic for Varnakiotis, one of the most ambiguous and most important of the Armatols in Western Rumili, which is full of the most fascinating documents detailing his intimate friendships with the Albanian Bays. And in Odessa in 1909, if I remember, there is a scholar of the Filikieteria who publishes an enormous compilation of documents on the Filikieteria. We're drowning in documents that have been published. And uh, it's just that I think there's too much. People didn't have the time to go through them all. And if you did have time to go through them all, um, you, could, you could come face to face with the realities of Greek life on the ground in the war um, for the most part without having to go to the archives. Now, there were things in the archives that have not been published. The one, the one discovery I enjoyed the most, perhaps, were the, the, the papers in Elia, uh, uh, the file on the harem of Khurshid Pasha. The whole story of the harem of Khurshid Pasha, which takes you into the relationship between the intimate life of a high ranking Ottoman official and the high politics of the time. So, of course, there are treasures in the archives and there are more that are going to come. But I realized what an immensity of material is now at our fingertips digitally sitting at home. Well, that reminds me, of course, of the way in which I remember you also talking about how you approached the story of the city of Salonika, where, again, I think you started with some primary material. <clears throat> you were dealing with an enormous accumulation. But um, if I may say so, what you're able to do that um, not every historian is, is being able to weave that into a narrative that really does tell a story. And um, I do feel this book really succeeds in doing that. Thank you, thank you. But you know, it can, it, it, you, it, it's a funny business. Uh, it, it can be at the odd, you can come across a document that then articulates what you've been trying to say all along, but you hadn't realized it. So for instance, a friend was kind enough to send me um, a very obscure collection of documents from Naples that is not online. Um, that was the Neapolitan diplomats' views of the Greek War of Independence, and it was published in the 1930s. And in it, there was a dispatch from the Neapolitan minister in London in 1825, in which he lays out with extraordinary lucidity what has happened for his rather dopey monarch. And he says to this guy, who's one of the most reactionary Bourbons in Europe, you have to understand that the passing of time matters politically. What we thought at the beginning does not count now because time has passed and the Greeks are still there. And, I, and it suddenly dawned on me what I was trying to say in the story. And that was the story. The Greeks won by not being defeated. But it was that document that had sort of crystallized it for me. Oh, that's a really nice example. Thank you for that. Um, let's move on and talk about an aspect of the revolution that for understandable reasons, Greek historians and educators deal with, had some difficulty in dealing with, and that's the civil conflict within the, uh, the revolution. I mean, you obviously don't shy away from it. There were two civil wars fought in the year 1824 and a third in 1831 after the assassination of Kapodistria. Um, and it's often said, and often quoted in relation to the Greek revolution, that 
every revolution brings in its train a civil war and people think of the American Revolution and then half a century later the American Civil War and so on. But um, I thought, I mean, you're, you, you grapple with those difficult issues um, unflinchingly, as I say. Um, I was also struck by a point you made, um, and I noticed it made more than once in your book, that although there was appalling violence on all sides um, during the revolution, and Greeks did at certain points fire upon and kill other Greeks, by and large, you argue, there was a, a resistance to the extremist forms of violence, at least, within the Greek or the Greek Orthodox community. Um, and I, <clears throat> I couldn't help connecting that with what you've written elsewhere about European assumptions about the Balkans, that Balkan peoples are violent. And you've argued in Europe, dark continent, that actually, you know, Europe is more violent than its periphery. I just wonder, <clears throat> could you, is, is, that, is, it, is it fair to draw these, these lines together? And would you like to say something about the conduct and the nature of those civil wars within the revolution? Yeah. Um, the two things I think are connected, the civil wars and the lack of violence, Greek on Greek or extreme violence. I think the, <coughs> What I tried to do in talking about the civil wars was to flip the question on its head. Not, not to ask why were the Greeks fighting each other and who, but why on earth should you not have expected the Greeks to fight one another? Because the whole point of this, once the Ottoman power had been swept away, was to figure out what political arrangement would take its place. And on that, there was absolutely no consensus. And everybody is determined to say that they are the power. And the whole political fascination is to see the different discourses of power. So that the, the oddity about Mavrogordatos is that he'll come in and he has this almost enlightenment European idea of administration. What the hell does Kolokotronis know about Vikisi, administration? He doesn't care about administration, and Drutsos doesn't care about administration. Frankly, the Kunduriotis brothers in Idra don't care about administration either. They care about Idra. So they were bound to be struggling with one another. The important point was to is clarify what they were fighting for. And I think the older historiography, which you just told you there was one lot of fighting and then there was another lot of fighting, wasn't quite getting at this point that the whole conflict is about the creation of a new kind of polity and it all has to be fought for and created in the fighting. Now, maybe one of the reasons that they can, they're so quick to turn on one another is that there is a rather strong sense that they are all in it as Greeks together, which also explains why they are very loath to kill one another so that even in the civil war, uh, fighting in the Peloponnese, there is ransacking of property, there is looting, there is torture, but it's an unusual thing. And when I say uh, unusual, I'm comparing it, say, with the French Revolution. Mm. The, in the, French Re the French Revolution was a bloodbath. The French were killing each other left, right, and center. They had no compunction in the Vendée, in Paris, uh, thousands of people died at the hands of other Frenchmen. This was not the case in Greece. The Greeks had no compunction about killing Muslims or Jews, but they had a compunction about, it did happen, but it was also one of the things that, you know, for instance, Andrutsos' willingness to kill counts against him. There are, there are men who stand out because they, they are ruthless in that way. And, and my sense is most of, the, most of the Greek chieftains were very low. Killing is a very, there's no going back from it. You, you've established a set of enemies and these were very sophisticated in their, in their wartime etiquette. They were very good at always keeping an exit door. Uh, always keeping open the possibility that things would change 
and today's enemy should become tomorrow's friend. And killing precluded that by and large. So there may have been reasons other than just sheer niceness why they didn't kill one another. But I, not much has been written about this, but I think it's a very striking feature that on the whole, they are very loath to kill one another. That's, um, no, that, that's, that's striking. And <clears throat> as you were speaking, it reminds me very much of something that has emerged in anthropological studies of Greece, that um, the whole sort of Greek performance of macho confrontation um, so often in everyday situations is governed by a rhetoric of restraint that the, the you, know, you know these stories of, you know people are sort of their, their fists are up at the same but you call out to people you know kratame, kratame. you know you call out to your friends behind you to hold you back yeah. so that you won't go over the limit and maybe that is something that's uh, that's that it's something as you say it hasn't been much talked about and I uh, I think perhaps it's been overshadowed by the, the overall image of I extreme violence, which obviously was a, fe was a feature of the revolution. But, but even then, if, you if you read Fotakos's memoirs of famous battles, the famous battles are generally preceded by a lot of insults going to and fro across the lines, which is interesting because it means everybody understands everybody else. It absolutely is, and of course, and of course it's, it's I mean, it's, it's so Homeric, isn't it? Yeah. I mean, yeah. that's exactly what happens in the Iliad. And uh, in parenthesis, I was struck that you singled out for Tacos, um, whose memoirs I think are not that much read as being one of the, you know, one of the great sort of primary chroniclers of the, of the revolution. Um, I, they're, I, I, they're absolutely amazing. They're mind blowing. And he's <laughs> also very sophisticated sociology sociologically so you have this guy from a village background who's at the heart of the heart of the revolutionary effort is very unsentimental he talks about his own shock when he sees masses of bodies that the turks have killed for the first time uh, he talks about his own misgivings it, it, it i think it's a completely remarkable source yeah i i, I agree i mean maybe <clears throat> since we've been talking about violence maybe just stay <clears throat> stay with that for a little uh, a little more um be, and just think about the the behavior of people in a situation where basically, <clears throat> as you were saying a little, uh, a little while ago, um, you know, the existing order has collapsed and everybody's just sort of fighting to create, to save what they can, to impose their own will <clears throat> if they can. And um, I couldn't help remembering that uh, you, of course, are again the primary historian of the same part of the world in a different historical moment when once again civil authority completely collapsed, namely the Nazi occupation of 1941 to 1944. Um, and there was just there's one episode that particularly reminded me of, of that. It's it comes in 1827, where a local a Peloponnesian leader whom I'd never heard of called Dimitrios Nenekos, not only cozies up to Ibrahim and the Turks, but he actually starts punishing Greeks who fail to submit. And he's one who does kill fellow Greeks. And I was reminded of the security battalions, mm -hmm. those groups of young Greek men recruited by or for the Nazis to hunt down communists in exactly the same area. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> um, again, in a time when civil order completely collapsed in the 1940s. And I wondered how, having studied both those phenomena, I mean, do you think there is any kind of intrinsic connection? Well, the intrinsic connection is, is probably topographical. It's extremely hard for an occupying force, whether you're talking about the Germans or the Egyptian army in the Peloponnese, to completely subdue an extremely mountainous terrain because the cost of shipping enough soldiers down there is prohibitive and so you never have enough men and so one thing that you can do is just um, a, a scorched earth policy um, which they both pursue both the Germans and Ibrahim but the other policy uh, which is more durable if you can if you can make it work is to change the cost benefit calculus for the Greek peasantry so that they end up supporting you and turning on the insurgents and that is what the commanders in Patras start 
to do very effectively. And they are helped by the ruthlessness of Ibrahim and by his willingness to sell uh, hundreds or thousands of Greek villagers into slavery, which terrifies the villagers. So there, there, the, the, there, is a, there is a relationship between the willingness to use overwhelming draconian force and the willingness to contemplate the use of collaborators. The difference is this, that um, in the Ottoman milieu, which is now ending in the 1820s, moving from side to side was not talked about in the language of collaboration. It was a completely normal thing to do. Many of the great Rumelia armatols had four. I mean, if you try to register the number of times an Andrutsos or Karaiskakis changed allegiances in the early years, it, it's absolutely bewildering. They go to and fro between the Sultan and the Greeks and Ali Pasha and the Greeks. And this was like normal modus operandi for a powerful military figure. It was not talked about under the rubric of collaboration. Now, of course, Mavrogordatos introduces this language of treachery when he engineers the trial of Karaiskakis. Yes. And Karaiskakis is redeemed and Karaiskakis realizes that there is now a new discourse which is as powerful as he is. And you really do have to choose. Varnakiotis never really understands this and is dispatched. He, he, he moves over to the Ottoman side, thinking, well, this is what I've always done. Now I want to come back to the Greek side where things are better. And they say, well, it's not that simple anymore. So Nenekos is operating against the backdrop of that tradition. The Egyptians are not the Turks and the Albanians. It's already different. But in the 1940s, you're in this world where there's no toing and froing. There's really none. Gilas, Milovan Gilas puts it very well for the Yugoslav case. It was a Manichaean situation. They'd engineered a Manichaean situation between them, the partisans and the Germans. You were either for us or against us, and there was no third way. Yes, that's, um, I mean, that extraordinary, I mean, <clears throat> as you say, that, um, that switching of sides in Romali is notorious. And of course, the, as for so many things, the Greeks have a word for it, tokapaki, as you, uh, <clears throat> as you, uh, as you explain. Um, let's, um, let's move, okay, let's, let's move beyond, let's move beyond the fighting. Um, because one, I mean, the way the story has always been told, and I mean, it has to be, is as a story, it's often called a war of independence. So I'm glad that, <clears throat> you, like me, favour calling it what the Greeks do, the revolution. Um, but it is a war. So, OK, a lot of the story is about battles and fighting. But it seems to be an, an, a long stretch of the period that we conventionally think of as the Greek revolution is, is characterised not so much by fighting, actually, as by diplomatic activity. Quite a lot of it within Greece but a lot of it also um, in the capitals of Europe. And it's, I noticed, I mean, I noticed it with Finley and I think all the histories of the revolution, you know, by the time, <clears throat> by the time you get to about it, the time you get to the Battle of Navarino, you know, the story is almost over. And in your book too, I think, you know, out of 600 pages, um, you probably just under a hundred is the period from Navarino to the end. Um, I sometimes have the, the suspicion that there's a, there's a diplomatic story and a story about what diplomacy can achieve that feats of arms maybe don't, kind of still waiting to be told. Mm -hmm. Do you think there's mileage in that or Absolutely. what we thought about those stages? Absolutely. I mean, look, the first thing to say is that historians in general, are much better, are much more preoccupied with beginnings than with endings. Origins of the First World War, origins of the Second World War, origins of the Gulag, origins of the concentration camp system, origins of the Holocaust. Uh, it, it, uh, historians are uh, drawn to causation, and cause, the cause of something happening. They're not so readily drawn to explain in the cause of something ceasing to happen any longer, even though I think you're right, and they should be, and that, that often that's as interesting a question. 
So it's interesting the question of why Soviet communism had the capacity to bring the gulag to an end as it did to start it in the first place. So I'm completely with you on that point. In the case of Greece, the second thing to say is that I think there is a dilemma that's illustrative of the things I, that drew me into the subject in the first place. What do I mean? It's fairly clear when the story begins. It begins sometime in the spring of 1821. It's not at all clear when it ends, which is another way of saying that these questions of sovereignty and independence are open-ended and ambiguous. And Finley ends his two volumes on the history of the Greek Revolution in 1843. He goes right up to that. And so I was very conscious of this question of, of endings. The one thing is settled at Navarino, more or less, which is it is really at that point inconceivable that the European powers will allow some significant proportion of these lands to fall again under the sway of the Ottoman Sultan in any meaningful sense. It's the end of Ottoman power in the Peloponnese and some of the islands. So that's a place to end. It's not the, but that's not the point at which Greece is internationally recognized, which might be another place to end. Still less is it the point at which Greece acquires constitutional government, which might be another place for it to end, and so on. There are multiple points at which you could end. The reasons, I think, for uh, drawing things to a close in 1827, well, one of them is I defy anybody to get to grips with the total anarchy that is unleashed in Greece on Capodistrius's death. It's an extraordinarily complicated environment that lasts for several years, and in fact lasts after King Otto arrives. That Neapolitan embassy, ambassador that I talked about had said, Europe is faced with two choices. Uh, is faced with the choice of either the, the Ottoman Turk come in and massacre everyone, or continued civil war in Greece after we give them some kind of independence. Mm. And his recommendation was you have to do the latter because it's more humane. But the sense was Europe doesn't really need to worry. The Greeks can have anarchy, provided it doesn't jeopardize the political stability of the continent. And you have anarchy for some period of time. I, I completely agree that it's a rich and unexplored terrain and many things get worked out in those five to 10 years, but I fear that it would have been too much for my readers. Well, I, I think, I mean, I'm sure you're right, actually. And of course, the trouble with, uh, with diplomatic history or trying to put diplomacy into the sort of hot seat is that in the nature of that activity, it is just less exciting to readers, isn't it? But it, it may be that it's partly the diplomatic history, um, which can be less exciting to read, but, but actually you'd want to combine it with the, with the tussle for power and the creation of institutions inside Greece. And that for a long period is extraordinarily complicated anarchic stuff as well. Fa absolutely fascinating. It would warrant a book, but it, it would be very difficult to disentangle it. Well, I mean, there's a thought because uh, that classic book by John Petropoulos on the decade of Bavarian rule remains, it's more than half a century old now. And it's, still, it's still a classic. It's it a, is, it is a classic, but there's an awful lot actually become available that wasn't available to him. Yeah. Um, maybe that's something you might be interested in for a, another book. Maybe. Um, well, I had, been going to, I had been going to ask you about the, uh, about the end and when it ends, but you've, um, <clears throat> you've very helpfully covered that. So let's, uh, let's move on to something uh, something else. Um, I noticed reading it, and then I actually I actually read the book in the um, in this in this format, which the publisher kindly uh, sent. So I, I caught up with the real thing um, <clears throat> uh, just quite recently. Um, and one thing that well, it has the wonderful pictures, by the way. I think I really do recommend the pictures. Many of those real rarities, um, but it also has an index which I didn't have the benefit of, because um, I'd meticulously noted a whole series of pages where you talked about slavery. Mm -hmm. And then I found 
do you've done a really good job of the index so actually they're all itemized but you could have saved me quite a lot of work but seriously um the issue of slavery the role of slavery the way the enslavement and selling of human beings was um weaponized by the ottomans and the overlap and sometimes direct conflict between that and the abolitionist movement in uh, elsewhere in europe seems to it brings a whole dimension to a conflict of 200 years ago that is some, somehow, well, it is not somehow, but it's a fact, is very much uh, in everybody's face in, um, in the 2020s. Yeah, um, right. yeah. I just want, would you perhaps elaborate on, I mean, how, you, how the, the very fact that this is so well documented is the material from the story of the Greek Revolution that actually might assist historians of the institution of slavery and of the means of its ab abolition? Oh, no, there's no question that it's an important and rather neglected chapter. And in fact, as a sideline, there is a whole subgenre mm -hmm. of the American traveler to the Mediterranean in the 1830s and 40s and 50s, who invariably feels compelled to visit the slave market in Istanbul or in Cairo. And, and you, we have 20, 30, 40, 50 of these accounts, and some of them generate very interesting reflections um upon upon slavery back home uh, I, I won't bore you with the details but some very important figures in the american debate come into contact with ottoman slavery um i think the first thing to say is that um although the rhetoric subsequently was of the greeks being released from servitude um in fact the Ottoman enslavement of Greeks at various points, mass enslavement, was something really unusual and new and surprising for modern times on the scale on which it took place. The mass enslavement of Greeks after Hios, for instance, floods the slave market of Istanbul and the price of slaves plummets because it was not used to having so many people enslaved. Um, Actually, everybody was doing it. Uh, the Greeks were enslaving um, Muslims in the Peloponnese. And um, that's a completely unexplored subject that we can get glimpses of from the odd document here or there. And then when the Ibrahim and the Egyptian army come in, they en use enslavement as a means of terror. Uh, and there are French officers in the Egyptian army who have harems of their own slaves, and we have the documentation of that. And then after the war, the redemption of the captive Greek slaves becomes possibly the number one or two diplomatic issue for the new Greek state, especially in Egypt. So slavery is all over this story. And then it's over it in another way as well, which is to say that I think that abolitionism had been the great European liberal cause uh, at, towards the end of the Napoleonic era. It's on the table at the Congress of Vienna, it, transatlantic, the abolition of transatlantic slave trade. And many of the same people who felt strongly about abolitionism felt strongly about the Greeks and the redemption of the Greeks. There was a big overlap, not completely neat, uh, between abolitionism and Philhellenism. It was intensified ironically in the Greek case by racism, which is to say that many people wanted to redeem the Greek slaves in particular because they were being captured by black African soldiers of Ibrahim Pasha's army and cr Christians were being enslaved by Muslims. So abolitionism can take many odd forms. And then of course you have the American angle on this where, and the most interesting angle I think was to start to delve into the African-American view of the Greek struggle. And we do, and I, I, I mentioned this at one point, we do have the commentary from African, free African-American writers in New York writing saying it is a very perverse thing that the leading American abolitionists are waxing lyrical about the need to free the slaves of the Ottoman Empire uh, and what about the slaves black, back home? Uh, and indeed, many American abolitionists were uh, uh, many, uh, many American Philhellenes were were not abolitionists at home at all. 
And so bringing Greece into the story of slavery and the history of Western racism becomes a way of picking at some of the complexities of this. I think in the past, the story of Phil Hellenism, of international Phil Hellenism, had been told in a very kind of rosy tinted way. Ah, this is the story of liberalism. This is the great liberal cause. Well, it's true, it was a great liberal cause, but some of those great liberals were also completely comfortable with slave-owning slave plantation economies in the southern states. And not only Americans. I mean, I learned quite recently that uh, <clears throat> the um, Thomas Gordon, who actually lavished some of his, a lot of his own funds on freeing the Greeks, um, his own family fortune was based on estates in Jamaica, yeah. and the he was actually he actually accepted the compensation when the um, when slavery was abolished in the 1830s. So it is possible to be a, a liberal and to wish to free fellow humans in one situation, but not to see, somehow just not to see it in, a, in another. And Gordon was a fascinating and very sensitive man who is so overwhelmed by what he sees about the Greek atrocities against the Muslims in Tripolitsa in the summer of 1821 that he, he leaves and he vows, he has a sort of breakdown and vows never to go back. He changes his mind. Yes. This was, this was not an insensitive man at all. The no, author of one of the great accounts of the war. Indeed, thank you. Yes. Coming towards the the end, the the book has a rather tantalising, I thought, double ending because you end the main narrative um, by <clears throat> following through the the survivors and um, the astonishing Mavrogenis, <clears throat> who are. It must have been something like 112 by the time he died, if these dates are correct. <laughs> it's a, you know, a lot of these things. An example to us all. Uh, exactly, it's wonderful. Um, so in effect, you end at the turn of the new century when Athens has uh, has multiplied 10 times in size. It's become the national, uh, the national capital and the stage is set for a whole new world that really, I mean, Greece has changed, but as you also make clear, Europe has changed too. But you don't quite end there. You um, then take us back to the 1820s and you tell this, uh, this, this wonderful local story about the discovery of the miracle working icon on the island of Tinos. And you end with that. Um, now, I know you have a, a personal connection with the island of Tinos. You know, you know the place and its people very, uh, very well. Obviously also its history. Um, I just wondered, you know, in the, in the sort of economy of how you round off a narrative, how exactly you see the role of the miracle working icon? I mean, I'm not supposing you take it as being literally a miracle, but you do compare it to the miraculous, seemingly miraculous creation of the Greek nation state against all the odds. Well, I think that's the takeaway line of the book, for starters. So it helped it, 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 it assert that that was the overarching, that this was a completely unpredictable, in some sense, inexplicable occurrence. Um, but I'd say a couple of other things that, that I wanted to end by drawing attention to two things that it's very easy to become detached from, or maybe easy for me to become detached from. One is the land, the soil, the earth. Um, end up sounding like Heidegger or Carl Schmitt, but in any case, you can tell history in a kind of abstracted way, but really so much depended on the topography, on the soil. And here was a story that was rooted in the soil of a very specific place that I happen to know pretty well. And so I can convey what that meant and why that, why that mattered. And I think it did matter and it mattered for the whole conflict and it wasn't just Tinos, but that's an illusion. So you get into the land and the intimacy with the land and what the land allowed you to do. And the second thing that that uh, allows you to talk about is faith and religion. And historians tend to be very secular. It's a secular discipline. Uh, we're not you know, in the business of providing theodicies. And if we have religious views, we keep them to ourselves. And that's probably as it should be. It was not, however, true of the protagonists of this conflict. And so it's easy to overlook the real power 
of religious thought and religious feeling as an element in the conflict. Um, and so I thought it was very important to put that there. And then the third and last thing is that by talking about this, it was very deliberate that I wanted to end by talking about this as a miracle, because it takes it, it takes the whole story out of the historical realm into the realm of the divine and the miraculous. And I just wanted to leave the reader with that question lingering in their mind without sort of saying it in a very boring academic way, which is what do we do when we try to present something as history, as opposed to what we do when we present it as the unfolding of God's will. And that was the point of ending in that way. You suddenly alienate the whole historian's task by ending with a miracle. Yes, I think that's. Um, I wouldn't have put it like that, but I think that I, I see what you, I see what you mean. And of course, uh, we haven't really talked about the role of religion and the, the 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 revolution as a war of religion. But of course, that is a very important element of it. And uh, at various points in the book, you you bring that out very uh, very fully uh, as well. Um, for a final question. Um, just speculating a little bit and moving forward beyond your your subtitle, the making of modern uh, of modern Europe. If Greece, through the revolution, becomes the harbinger of the new nineteenth and then twentieth century Europe of nation states, um, and if belatedly historians and one might hope the general public come to associate the Greek Revolution in its as a, one of the motive forces, one of the motive moments in that development. How then do we reflect on the Greek achievement in the broader history of nations and nationalism in Europe? Um, without trivializing it, um, if you think of the language of that marvelous English spoof of public school history, 1066 and all that, you know, where ev everything is divided into is a good thing or a bad thing, or kings are good kings and bad kings. Um, in that, uh, in that kind of, in that kind of language, was, you know, was the Greek Revolution wholly a good thing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I grew up on 1066 and all that as well. So uh, I, I, I'm with you about the importance of that particular book. Um, no, of course, you don't want to. Well, I don't I, I don't feel the need to come down on one side or another side. And in fact, uh, I tried to tell the story in that way. I mean, there was uh, uh, it was an astonishing achievement that was accompanied by a good deal of bloodshed on both sides. Um, I, I'm only interested in charting what changed as a result and many 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 things changed and i and i outline some of them i mean the entire fabric of society changed that's what it's really my business um to document you suddenly have a world in which you have streets with names and you have universities and and you have steamships you have all these things that come, and I would say as a result of, of course, you're gonna have some of them in the Ottoman Empire as well, but in the Greek case, the bringing of national independence, the access to capital markets and capitalism, it's all connected. So that's my, that's my task. Do I think all of these things are unambiguous good things? No, I don't think most people think they're unambiguously good things. It's just what you want to show is the significance of this huge shift. And the Greeks, in that sense, are mapping a path because it's going to come uh, to other places in Europe and then around the Mediterranean and the rest of the world afterwards. Well, exactly. I mean, exactly. I mean, this is a point that you, know, you have made and I never tire of making as well, that, you know, the Greeks achieved national independence uh, 40 years before the great national unifications that define modern Europe of Italy and Germany. Yes. But you know, everybody talks about 1848 and then the 1850s and the German and Italian unifications completed in 1871. But the Greeks right. were actually there, you know, almost half a century before, uh, yeah. before that. Um, I mean, what can historians do to change that picture, do you think? You mean to get people to pay more attention to, to the significance of the Greek uprising? Well, I suppose they can write Maybe you've done it. This is the answer. <laughs> That's what I, I can't do any more than that. Okay, well, 
<laughs> let's not ask about any more of you than that either. Thank you. Um, that sounds like a cue for me to hand back to John. Um, it does look as though lots of people are <clears throat> coming up with uh, interesting comments. I haven't been able to read them as I've been uh, I've been conversing, uh, as you heard, but I see John is looking intently at his screen. So let me hand back to you, John. Yes, thank you. Thank you both very much. That was, that was fascinating. We've had lots of good comments in the chats about how much people have enjoyed it. In a normal world, there'd no doubt have been a, an enormous round of applause, but you'll have to make do with virtual applause uh, in this virtual world. Um, just a reminder to people that if you want to pose a question, please type it into the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen, and we'll do our best to uh, pose those over the next 20 minutes or so. Uh, to, to both of our, our, our uh, discussants. Um, there are a number in there already, so I'll start with uh, the first that's in there, which, and you'll have to forgive me struggling slightly, my screen's further away than it ought to be, but uh, never mind. Um, first question from David Schra is um, about Greek nationalism and civil wars. Was there any possibility of a different future of a balkanized Greece with local statelets, Corfu, Crete, Morea, etc.? Uh, in the area that is now Greece? Um, well, of course, some people would say that's exactly what you got, because uh, indeed the Ionian Islands were under different dispensation. Uh, Samos was under a different dispensation. Uh, and was there the possibility of a, a, a non-Ottoman uh, dominated uh, imperium uh, that was in the minds of some of the Greek participants, and Drutsos rather liked this idea because he thought he could be in charge of a big chunk of it. Um, but I don't think that was ever like, and it's possible that the, the, the Russians were thinking in this kind of way. But once you had the, 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 this was never going to be an option once the British and the French were involved they were very loath to be involved. It was a very odd combination of circumstances that got them involved. And once they were involved, they were going to back the, the smallest conceivable Greece that could be made viable, I think. So I think the answer is probably no. If I could just butt in on that one, at the time when Byron was in Greece in early 1824, um, among the Philhellenes, uh, and in his circle, at least, there was very serious conversation about a federal, uh, about Greece becoming a federal republic in which the islands by which they meant either and Spetses would be one bit, the Peloponnese another, and Drutsos is um, Stereia and so on. And um, those, I forget whether it's in one of the, in Paris memoir of Byron, or it's, um, it's uh, I think it's, um, <clears throat> it's a handwritten note I, I seem to remember seeing in the Finley Library at the BSA, where Finley comments on something else, and he lists about 10 different provinces that he thought would, would have to have some degree of autonomy, um, you know, within a liberated Greece. This is during the, during the yeah. 1820s. And I do wonder, exactly as you say, Mark, uh, Mark if it hadn't been for Navarino, um, an, an independence or a form of local autonomy without international involvement could well have splintered in the way you describe. Yeah. yeah. Funny you should mention a note in the Finlay, but uh, Michalis Sotiropoulos, uh, who knows the Finlay archive or is getting to know it rather well, um, says in Finlay's archive there's a note by Finlay where he talks about what motivated him to write the history. And he says that he was thinking of writing a memoir, but then he saw Tricoupis's history and then he wanted to write a counter history, literally using that last word and generally being very critical about it. Yeah. Uh, that tells us a lot about the historian's motivation and about the importance of the intellectual context for understanding such endeavors. How could we conceptualize the difference between the two authors? Uh, and for Pref Professor Mazar in particular, in writing your work, did you have your tricoupis uh, or a historiogra historiographical current that you wanted to stand against? You know, I used to I used to think the 19th century Marxists were a bad tempered lot until I started reading 19th century Greek historians of 1821, who really put them to shame. And, and there's the, the classic case of Canelos Delianis's memoirs that were basically so invective and insult driven that his family sat on them for 100 years, lest they jeopardize their political chances. 
So there is a huge sense when you read all this stuff of people arguing against one another with massive vehemence, or, and for that matter, and accusing one another of being paid hacks of the Mavrogodatos faction or the Kolokotronis faction. And there was some merit to that. I actually, um, I made a decision after reading Finley that I was going to uh, dive into the primary sources and I was going to immerse myself in the recent literature, not the great classics, because one of the things that we haven't talked about is this, this the wonderfully flourishing stage of the historian's profession in Greece right now, and how it's how the study of 1821 in particular in the last 20 years, I'd say it was the generation of the 45s and under for the most part, have completely transformed our understanding of this topic. So I really wanted to familiarize myself with all the articles in Taistorica and Mnimon in all the great journals and, and the monographs. Uh, and, and so I came back to Tricupis very late in the process. And then, you know, you can, then you start to understand very clearly um, where they are coming from politically. Uh, one of the things that uh, I was very struck by was what, what few of these historians seem to be interested in, that the modern historians are very interested in. The powerful presence of the Albanians, the, the military economy. How do you actually get people to fight for you? Actually, Fotakos in his memoirs is really interesting on this, and you suddenly understand that. But none of the historians really talked about that. What did it mean to tax the peasants in the Peloponnese in 18? These are totally fundamental questions if you want to understand how people were fighting at all, because they were they needed to be kept alive and paid. And I have to say that none of the great historians really thought that was their business as historians. They essentially saw themselves, I don't want to introduce them, but they essentially saw themselves as political historians. And so they were very good on that. But if you went back to Casomulis, if you went back to Fotakos, if you went back to the original, the testimonies of those who were there, they were very sensitive to those things. And so I spent much more time in the memoir literature than I did in the great classics of 19th century historiography, which to be honest, I, I have to say, I, I tend to find rather dull. I, I probably shouldn't say that. Um, we've had three or four questions which um, invite you to say a little more about what you mean by the making of Europe, uh, or the global significance, um, making of modern Europe again. Um, I wonder if, uh, I mean, Roddy slightly, partly covered that in his questions, but do you want to say anything more about um, the, the, the wider context, as it were, and what you were, what you were getting at? Yes. Um, well, so I, 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 I can get to this from a number of points of view. I, I think when you start to think about it, the 1820s, the, after, the, the restoration period, is an extraordinarily fertile one with long run consequences in European world history from many angles. Um, and the Greek revolution being one of the key disputes is at the heart of those. We've talked about the sensitivity to the power of nationalism, but we could also talk about uh, something else that comes along with that, which is internationalism. Uh, which is the sense that in this fractious age in which international politics is no longer the preserve of noble statesmen, but God help us, people are getting involved and peoples are getting involved, you need to have mechanisms for states to consult one another. And uh, the Holy Alliance is part of that, but actually the conferences that produce the recognition of Greece are later recognized as a fundamental chapter in the emergence of modern international governance. I would say that one of the key features of modern political life is the power of public opinion. It had not been a feature of 17th or 18th century political life anywhere. It becomes a very important feature of 19th and 20th century, so important that we take it for granted today. Greece is perhaps the first issue which I would say is decided by a transnational wave of public opinion. In this case, pushing governments that would otherwise have been loath to do this to support the Greeks. Romanticism is part of the same trend. 
Now I could go on into other areas, but those would be illustrative of, of uh, major long run changes in the, modern, in the modern world that come out of the Greek crisis. Great, thanks. Just a reminder to people, if you do want questions posed, please put them uh, into the Q&A box, not into the chat. I'm seeing a couple in the chat. Many of them are comments, that's fine. But if you want a question put, uh, we'll do our best to get round to them. Um, a question from Michael Llewellyn-Smith. Um, are there interesting things emerging this year in the outpouring in Greece of books, articles and conferences about 1821, etc., which throw new light on the way the Greeks view the revolution and its meaning for them today? Well, I'd love to hear what Roddy has to say about this. I'll say something, but maybe Roddy, you would also. I think one of the things that struck me, uh, I've talked about this with people elsewhere, is the relative sobriety and scholarliness of the discussion of the public discussions and perhaps COVID in a funny way helped. It cut back on the big lavish uh, speeches. Um, I think the normal rhythms of scholarly life uh, mean that we've had really excellent new books on 1821 last year and the year before, and we will next year and the year after as well. Um, I do think the catalog to the big Benaki 1821 exhibition, the catalog is going to endure as a source book of many kinds. Mm. Um, so I, I don't, I think we're in the middle of a scholarly wave. I could cite a number of things that very young scholars have produced over the last five years and likely to produce in the next five. And I think we should all support that. But I'd hesitate to say that this year has stood out from judged against that standard. But Roddy, I wonder what you think. Well, I mean, it's a question that, um, I mean, because like you, I'm a member of this, committee, um, I, I get asked, and um, I, I, I still don't know how to answer it. And how I tend to answer it is, I, I, um, you know, as the Chinese say of the French Revolution, it's too soon. Um, you know, we, the anniversary is still not quite over. Um, I'm not convinced that we necessarily have seen all the things that are going to come out of it, that may actually change the way um, people in the years to come are going to are going to are going to going to think about it i'm sure a lot of inevitably what has come out of the anniversary is going to be fairly ephemeral fairly um and i think a lot of it's very high quality <clears throat> to what extent it's actually game changing i don't know I and mean, one of the things i i looked for in the um i was going to say the revolution in the um, in the anniversary of the revolution is actually as I think the questioner, as my, Michael's question implied, um, a um, you know a resetting of the dial or a new set of attitudes or assumptions in the way that people, particularly in Greece, but not only in Greece, actually think about these events. Um, talking to Greek friends, I mean, I get a, I hear a lot of pessimism actually. That a lot of people have said to me that actually it is just all about parades and postanelis. Uh, and um, the the same old you know paliatro paria, um, which if so is a would be a shame. I mean, as you say, I mean at the level of academic historiography, I mean there's a lot of very serious, very interesting things going on, and that can't be put back in its in in its bottle. That's really important, um, and it is bigger than just the just the anniversary. But in terms of the public sphere, um, I'm not sure that. You know the the sort of twenty fifth March parade in twenty twenty two will be any different from it was in what it was pre uh, pre pandemic. Um, I, I, do, I do think the the Shukru Ilichak uh, collection of Ottoman documents that anybody can consult online, just published this year by Brill, is a game changer. And that if you just browse through that, a totally new picture of what happened through Ottoman eyes. It's, it, 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 it's a wonderful, wonderful thing to browse through, I think. Absolutely. Um, we've got lots of questions and uh, not an infinite amount of time, so I'm going to be a bit ruthless here. I'm going to pick one from Bruce Clark, since he's sort of implicated in the whole trilogy thing. Um, he asks, uh, did the more liberal vision of Rigas Ferreos for a broader Balkan federation embracing different ethnicities and religions ever have a chance? And he points out that's a slightly different question from the question we had about a balkanized Greece. I don't think it did. 
I, I think that, that the, there were intellectuals who were very attuned to it. And of course, his name had terrific resonance. Um, but the, the speed and scale of the bloodletting in the Peloponnese, the short answer would be the speed and the scale of the bloodletting in the Peloponnese in the summer of 1821 shows you that what's driving the ordinary individuals who are taking up arms on the Greek side is nothing like Ferris's vision. And actually, I could go even further back. The very first conflict which takes place in, on the Danube in Galati in February 1821, actually the day before uh, Alexandros Ypsilantis crosses the river Prut, in which the Eteria rises up to take the town and they slaughter the Muslims, just shows you that the, even within the Eteria, the average Eterist is not a Rigas Pireos. Uh, uh, it doesn't, they don't have that vision. Um. This is the question because I'm curious to hear, hear what you say, because I think you actually cover this quite well in the book, but it didn't come out particularly in the discussion. But Andreas Sombanakis asks, was there a homogenous Greek identity in 1821? What unified Greeks in a war of liberation, religion, ethnicity, the sense of a nation? Well, I think, I think you can see very clearly that they're not unified for a lot of the time. And although people will talk the language of Greece when they talk about Patrida, often they're really talking about Rumeli or Morea, or actually they're not really talking about Rumeli or Morea, they're talking uh, 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 about uh, their homeland, they're, they're talking about Caritina in the case of Kolokotronis, for instance. And, um, and it, this surfaces in the documents at various points when things become, become tough, that the Rumeliots, of course, are very willing to turn on the on the Peloponnesians and vice versa. They're always anxious about being abandoned by the other or being attacked by the other. The, the islanders themselves are split between those who have the ships and those who have the cows, to put it bluntly. Uh, either a Spetsium Sara on the one hand and the richer islands on the other. It, 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 the work of unification is work. It's hard, hard work. Mm -hmm. it, isn't, it isn't a glue. Uh, there is something not least the shared threat from the enemy by virtue of the fact that you're an Orthodox Christian who has taken up arms, but that's it for much of the time. Um, two questions which both slightly relate to the idea of the Megali there. Um, so um, one question, as we move from the bicentennial of 1821 to the centennial of 1922, what would be the perspective of that book in the absence of the Megalia there? And then secondly, if I can find it again, um, do you think that the Greece established after the liberation pleased the Greeks? Uh, in connection with this, do you agree with the view that the Megalia there emerged due to the dissatisfaction of the Greeks? Well, I don't quite know really what to make up of the first question. So I'm going to turn to the, to the Second, I mean, there is an interesting question to be asked about how the anniversary of the catastrophe will impact our understanding of 1821. I can, I can see that. Um, you know, one of the things about the catastrophe is, is, is it takes place in an era where people are obsessed by boundaries and territory and land. And one of the interesting things about 1821 is that when the revolution occurs, actually you don't get the sense that everybody is sitting around with a map saying we're going to fight for this territory and this territory has to be it. everybody hopes their territory will be in it somehow but Elada doesn't have a primarily territorial or, or even geographical connotation it has something else it has either a religious or a cultural connotation i would say to generalize wildly so there are two different two different epochs there i think really I'm sorry, can you remind me what the second question was? Um, I've, now, <laughs> I've now hidden it, but it's the second. All right, yes, no, it, it was about the sense of incomplete mission, of failure. That's right, yeah, yeah. Well, mission think, not accomplished. Right, well, you know, uh, 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 revolutione mancata in Gramsci's phrase, a fail, failed revolution. I think this was one of the reasons why I wanted to end with the question of the miracle, because the rubric under which so many people understood the, the uprising in 1821 was Naftiaxumeto Romeko, 
to make the Romaico. And the Romaico really existed in the realm of, of the divine. It was about the resurrection of a Christian Byzantium, a resurrection of the power of the Virgin Mary. And so it was very, in, very hard to see international recognition of a new state by other new states as equating to the resurrection of Christian power under the benign rule of the Virgin Mary. And that's why I think you start to get from the very beginning of independence, this language that Roger has written very eloquently about of the sense of failure of all, all always something that was that Greece has not done that it could be. It can take a territorial form in the Megali there but it can take other forms as well. And I wanted to say that that was sort of hardwired into Greece, modern Greece from the process of its formation, that it was very hard for people to see this as a political achievement and not as somehow halfway aborted divine achievement that needed to be completed in the future. Um, an interesting question from Gordon Davis about um, your Homeric that echoes that you referred to, that Roddy actually referred to um, in the revolutionary battles. And he points out Lord Byron's poetry, Isles of Greece evoked the Persian Wars. Did revolution, the participants and pro, or protagonists evoke throwbacks to other periods, uh, Alexandrian, Roman, Byzantine, to connect the revolution? And if so, why did they do that? Yeah, I think if there was one thing that was characteristic of this, it was like an overdetermined sense of the historical past. Um, and I think they did it for various, I mean, you know, Alexandros Ypsilantis is writing endless letters to Suliot chieftains saying, remember Leonidas, uh, remember Thermopylae, you too, you know, can be worthy of the courage of your ancient forebears. Everybody is doing this, everybody is likening everybody else to, uh, to the ancients. And then, as I said, there's, at the same time, there's this language of orthodoxy. Uh, as well of, of living up to what the what is demanded of you as, as, as a Christian. So I think it's very powerful. One of the reasons not to be too cynical is that canny figures like Mavro Michaelis know very well that this plays in Europe. And they're totally right, of course. I mean, there is no doubt that the Greeks uh, owe their success to the oddity of the fact that Europe is obsessed with the ancient Greeks. And they're obsessed with the ancient Greeks. And then they thought that what was happening, or some of them thought that what was happening was the ancient Greeks come back to life in some form in their modern descendants. And, and, the, and the Greeks were very canny and they knew how to play on this very well, I think. Um, another thread, um, the Russian thread. Um, uh, the question says, in your book, you have a great Russian thread uh, nothing warms the heart as an epigraph from Oigin Onegin, apparently. Um, what puzzles the questioner is why Greeks so firmly believed that the Tsar would come? Why this was such a magnet? Is it hard to believe that the memory of 1770 was that strong? I, I think that, I mean, I, I, I say all this very conscious of the fact that I don't read Russian. I wish I did. I think one's understanding of 1821 would be completely different. But I think there's an interesting question to be asked, which is how the Russian Revolution and especially the Cold War shaped our understanding of 1821. Because I, I think to a certain extent, although interestingly Woodhouse was one figure who was, who was exempt from this criticism and who did appreciate the importance of the Russian connection. But I think there has been a tendency until recently to downplay the significance of the Russian dimension, that Russia was the most important power in this whole story outside the, outside the Ottoman case, right up until the very end. I, 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 I hate to say this in the context of the British school, but much more important for much of this period than the British. And, you know, thank goodness for the British that they had Byron, because up until that point, they'd been really rather discreditable in the eyes of many Greeks. They were associated with the Ionian islands and the repression of the Greeks on the islands and Byron's coming and Byron's death and then Navarino transformed all of that. But in the process, I think we somewhat lost sight of the historic allegiances and the very close allegiances and were underpinned by the massive migration of Greeks to Russia 
to southern Russia, but then to very senior administrative positions in the Russian state. Kapodistrius is only one of these figures that, that means at a time when Russia itself is expanding, Russia has exploded onto the European stage, emerging as by far the most important power in the post-Napoleonic era. There are intimate connections with Greece. It was not absurd to put your trust in Russia. It, it, it presupposed a mis, it, it was based on a misreading of Russian priorities, but it wasn't inherently absurd. And in fact, uh, seven years later in 1828, Russian policy comes round to declaring war on the Ottoman Empire again. So it, it, it all comes back to timing. Uh, but I think there's a lot there that is waiting for us to, to, to unpack again. I mean, on that, if I could just butt in, I mean, I would recommend to the questioner the, um, uh, unless he was the author, um, uh, the book by Lucien Freire on uh, Russia and the making of modern Greece, which in which he actually argues specifically that Russia did more than any of the other powers, even as things actually turned out, and has very interesting things on the on the follows up uh, follows up later. But yes, the the importance of Russia, absolutely. But it's also interesting how early. Mavro Cordatos and um, Metropolitan Ignatius in Pisa and Livorno hit on the idea of encouraging Britain and France to, uh, or playing on the fears of Britain, and <clears throat> of Britain and France against Russia in order to bring them in as a counterweight. And I mean, <clears throat> you know more about this than I do. I'm not sure to what extent it could really be claimed that Mavro Cordatus invented the Eastern question, but I, I think he certainly did quite. A, he certainly did a lot to stir that pot. Very much so. Very much. They were very subtle, very astute in their willingness to play the two sides off against one another. Okay, I think I'm going to um, wind it up with two final questions. Um, one is from a questioner who. Um, is interested in the, those areas that did, didn't become Greece until Greek until the 20th century. Um, she has a particular interest in the Dodecanese, um, and she wonders what the Greek Revolution, what the impact of the Greek Revolution was in those regions. Well, um, variable, and there's some fascinating, there are fascinating sources from the time because, of course, it's not clear while the fighting is going on. Um, what territory, first of all, what the result is going to be, and then what territory is going to be incorporated within a new state and what, what are not. Um, the, the, when the revolution unfolds, there's fighting everywhere, and there are eterists in Smyrna who want to start an uprising in Smyrna. They're chased out of Smyrna by the leaders of the Greek community who are terrified that there would be a bloodbath. And in general, the, the problem for the Dodecanese uh, for most of the Dodecanese was that they were too easily accessible from the mainland and therefore it, they were loath to involve themselves in, in the war. They are, less, they are not loath to involve themselves in the maritime war, uh, but for instance Rhodes, which was the center of an Ottoman naval base, there was never any real chance of persuading the inhabitants of, of, of Rhodes to participate. And so there are, there are areas where there are uprisings, like Ivaluk on, on, the, on, the, on Kidonies, uh, further north. And then, of course, there's the tragic case of Chios. And, and by, the, by the summer of 1822, those two cases in particular have terrified people sufficiently up and down the coast of Asia Minor and into the Dodecanese that most, most of them are going to be very, very cautious before they rise up again about against the Ottomans. And the same is true for other parts of the Asia Minor. It's a very good question to chart the reactions of Greek communities right across the Ottoman Empire, because of course there were far more Greeks uh, outside what became Greece than there were inside it. Um, and so people have a different kind of calculus, but in most areas of the Ottoman Empire, the thing resolves itself within a year, a year and a half of the uprising. Okay, the, the final question, um, there, there are others there and I reassure those who've played, posed them that we'll get them to both of you uh, afterwards. But um, the question is whether you're going to write a follow-up to this book, uh, adding the diplomatic view. And I, I think I'll just turn that into what's your next book? Uh, 
I tried to write a I tried to write a book which explained how you couldn't discuss the diplomatic view except in conjunction both with European cultural history uh, and the history of public opinion and with what was happening on the ground that there's no real way to separate these things out um, and uh, as for the next project well it's really very uh, uh, close to the mission of the British school actually John which is oh. I'm starting to think about ways in which you could uh, well and uh, Roddy will help me too I think in this ways of thinking about the history of the Greeks from the Paleolithic and indeed geological era uh, through to the present, because it's such a unique place for the historian to work on. But I, I haven't got much further than that at this point. Thank well, you. that sets us up very nicely for our next uh, event in the trilogy, since Roddy's at least started from the Bronze Age and gone to, uh, to the present. Um, uh, thank you both very, very much, Mark, obviously, for writing the book in the first place, but uh, also for being here this evening and Roddy for uh, making it such a fantastic uh, discussion and all of you for your, your questions. I'm sorry we couldn't get to more of them.